Welcome, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Hello, welcome to the last session of the day. I am Paige Pope. I am CNI's communications coordinator. Um, I first want to, of course, thank you for being with us today. It's been a great first day, and I'm looking forward to seeing familiar faces and meeting some new people uh, after this session at the reception. Uh, so we are going to dive into the lightning round. So these will be five-minute back-to-back sessions. Very, very exciting. The heart will be racing. Um, I thank our speakers for, for joining us here as well. Uh, please hold your applause between each speaker if you can. I know it's hard not to. Um, and then also questions, please hold those until after at the reception. So following these five minute lightning sessions, my colleague Diane's going to come up and explain our breakfast discussion tables, which will take place tomorrow. And then there'll also be brief one minute roundups of those topics from some of the facilitators. So once the five minute lightning rounds are done, I ask that you please wait to also um, watch that as well. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Christina. Thank you. Hey everyone, I'm Christina Drummond. It's a pleasure to kick us off here with a quick update on a suite of research projects. Um, these are all aimed at strengthening our cyber infrastructure for the scalable trusted exchange of sensitive usage and impact metrics that have to do with um, the, the open access and publicly accessible research that's created in our public and commercial organizations that make up our ecosystem of scholarly communications. This update builds from a workshop that we held uh, prior to the spring CNI this year, funded through the National Science Foundation. And at that workshop, we had the objective of coming together to understand what was needed to scaffold our infrastructure here in the US to support that evidence-based decision-making that's related to open and public access impact. We brought together experts from publishers, platforms, data infrastructures, standards, alongside program officers to explore the topic, develop recommendations, and I only have five minutes, so I can't tell you all of what they did, but that's why we have QR codes here. So you can grab the proceedings, you can check out the videos that we pulled together. We have a wonder collection of expert invited talks on the state of usage and impact data. Suffice to say, there are multiple research action areas that we identified as necessary to inform this question of whether we need to have national cyber infrastructure, if that open infrastructure should be global, should be federated, and what that means. We explored how we need education, advocacy, but what came to the fore is that, first of all, we have to have a common vocabulary. We have to understand to collaborate, and from those collaborations, we also need to learn from minimum viable product. So, through the support of the National Science Foundation and the Mellon Foundation, we've been able to jumpstart some research to assess the unique aspects of usage and impact exchange for open journals and open data, and how that extends to books. While an infrastructure, an MVP, is moving forward to look at how best to exchange book usage data. An NSF eager is supporting team at Stratos to document and crosswalk usage and impact data vocabularies we commonly refer to as the fruit basket of metrics. So thinking about how we compare apples to apples to oranges to papaya, so on and so on. We need to understand that vocabulary and have those crosswalks in hand. The same award is also supporting some folks over at Clark and Esposito to analyze and document the usage data supply chains. So we understand how that data from the point of creation when folks access these digital research objects and scholarship outputs, all the way to the point where we need it for reporting and analytics and evidence-based decision making. And we have that for open access books. You see the bit.ly up there, but we also understand how does that particular supply chain differ for publicly accessible journal outputs and open data. In the meantime, the Global Open Access Book Usage Data Trust Effort, and I'm the executive director of, um, it continues to move forward with some research and development. And so with the support of the Mellon Foundation, we've started our technical development to complement ongoing governance and policy development. We have a team over at 67 Bricks that are in process of assessing the existing operational open science and open scholarly infrastructure environment because we want to build on what is already out there. We need to identify what meets the requirements to play specific roles in a scholarly communications usage and impact focused data space. And I'll pause and say if folks have never heard of data space, there's a whole thing called International Data Spaces, IDS. You guys can Google it. I only have five minutes. But that said, 
with this particular project, we're working to understand how this established European reference architecture model applies to our scholarly communications ecosystem and which entities that exist today can play some of the five key service roles that are necessary to run a data space, namely identity access management, metadata brokerage, data exchange, clearinghouse, so you can understand how those transactions occur, vocabularies providers, of which of course we have many, and a data processing app store, so we can all go to the same place. You might be able to tell that's a very complex onion. I'm all about the fruits and vegetables. I think I'm getting hungry. I know we have just a couple more minutes to reception, but I'll note here that the intent for the bulk usage data trust and the IDS pilot or the data space pilot isn't to recreate the wheel, but rather to bring together and reinforce our existing infrastructures that we use today in our institutions. And so with that, I'll note we're also wrapping up a year's work to draft rules for the ethical controlled data exchange and data use for that usage data that's coming both from public and commercial entities to those who are receiving it. And so these principles in general are gonna be put forth in a public rule book, you'll see that shortly, as we hand it over to some legal scholars to come up with model contracts. Uh, just in time for a first set of organizations to pilot the data space next year. So if you work with OA book usage data and you want to support the work we're doing, participate in a pilot, learn about data spaces, You'll get to find me at the reception. Thanks. All right, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Eric Mitchell. I'm the university librarian at UC San Diego and co-PI on leading an IMLS-funded three-year effort that seeks to develop data science expertise in doctoral students and early career information professionals. I'm here today speaking with you, uh, representing my co-PIs, uh, Jane Greenberg, Rachel Frick, and John Wheeler, as well as my colleagues in program planning leads, Crystal Goldman and Kevin Popovic. And I'm here today to talk with you about our focus on innovating professional education and to invite you to join us in exploring this idea over the next several months. So over the last five years, leading and its precursor project leads have trained dozens of fellows in data science and we're so proud to have these fellows moving on in their careers and excelling in their various roles. We're also really grateful for the dozens of mentor organizations and mentors who have participated uh, and supported these fellows over the last five years. And this December, we're graduating our final round of fellows uh, through the support of IMLS and we really are very appreciative of all the work everybody's put in. As we wrap up leading, we're working to publish our data science curriculum, we're working on publishing best practices and sustaining communities of practice, and we're looking past leading and asking questions about the future of professional education. So I know we all share a commitment to supporting the next generation of information professionals, and I recognize that leading is just one of many range, or many, a wide range of uh, these education programs. Uh, earlier today, I was chatting with a couple library directors and we were sharing best practices about supporting early career professionals. And I know a lot of us have been through programs like this. Within leading, we saw a lot of positive career outcomes uh, come from this, uh, from participation of our fellows. And we discovered, or rediscovered rather, that sustainability is one of the key challenges that all of these pro programs face in our field. And so as we thought about what sustainability means for leading, uh, we also noticed uh, that there were many different practices in place. And so these two issues, excuse me, these two issues, the realization that sustainability is a key problem and that there's many uh, examples of success prompted us to ask this question, how might we help libraries collaborate to innovate professional education that impacts recruitment, growth, and retention? As I said, this question has guided the work of leads and leading over the last five years and we think there's an interesting conversation for us to have as a broad information community in this space. So to explore this question, we're gonna con be convening a series of online workshops uh, in January and February 2024 with the goal of bringing us back together around uh, the CNI in San Diego next March to share what we've learned. And we're gonna use a design-focused methodology known as the Innovation Funnel, where we'll first learn more about the problem, something we uh, are all familiar with, We'll work on identifying possible solutions and then develop outcomes that we'll then present. So we would love to have you plug in and engage in this work. If you're interested in learning more, 
Uh, I encourage you to sign up on our listserv using the QR code here so we can share information with you as we conduct our planning. Uh, hit the datalist.design site to learn more about where we currently are and come to the Birds of a Feather breakfast that I'll be uh, hosting tomorrow morning at 7.30. Thank you. Carnegie Gemellen is pleased to announce a soft launch of Engine, the ecosystem for next generation infrastructure. Engine embraces the idea that infrastructure includes people and technology and that the best infrastructure is built when you embed engineering in a human-centered ecosystem. It reflects the realization that open source software and open science are drivers of next generation infrastructure. CMU's capacity for both has grown to the point where we feel we can influence national and even global strategy and programs and policies. Having said that, we recognize that no single institution is going to build next generation infrastructure by itself. So Engine is an umbrella framework through which we hope to identify partners both within and beyond CMU. Some of the initial programs and priorities include working on open science and automated science through the CMU Cloud Lab. Cliff mentioned this during his opening remarks today earlier. CMU Cloud Lab is an off-site, remote, state-of-the-art research facility for life sciences, materials science, and engineering research. Any CMU researcher with a computer and an internet connection will be able to access, experiment with, and share data, software, a wide array of in instrumentation, methods, protocols, AI and ML algorithms. Originally developed by Emerald Cloud Lab for Bay Area startup companies who explicitly do not want to share results with each other, we are re-engineering the platform for the broader, more open university environment. As an example, I'm glad to note that the Emerald Cloud Lab has open sourced its programming language for the platform. Cliff also mentioned that in October at CMU in Pittsburgh, with funding from the National Science Foundation, we convened a diverse group of participants to examine whether Cloud Lab could be a model or a platform for a national network of these so-called self-driving laboratories. So anyone with an internet connection and a computer will be able to conduct open automated science. Second program is looking at climate change and deforest decarbonization through the Open Energy Outlook. This is an initiative from the Scott Institute at CMU. It's a model for looking at the impact on decarbonization from different policy choices. Open source software, the CMU uh, OSPO is working with the team to build a community around its subsequent development and use. On the national stage, the Department of Energy has already expressed its interest in using this particular model. Cliff also mentioned the importance of cybersecurity. The CMU OSPO has been working with the Software Engineering Institute, which is a federally funded research and development center and charged by the Department of Defense to be its software advisory group. One potential point of connection with the broader network is I'm in discussions with Amazon Web Services around building a platform for evaluating AI-assisted and AI-generated code. Building on CMU's strength in computer science, we've been conducting some educational pilots that bridge theory and practice through using open source software as a laboratory while working with mentors from industry partners. Stephen Wally, an executive at Microsoft, has been leading this effort. This past summer, he taught with Michael Hilton from Computer Science. We're in active plans to teach this again next summer at CMU's campus in Doha, Qatar, and to build a workshop-style version of this at CMU's campus in Kigali in Rwanda providing some global exposure. The final program I'll talk to you about is the Open Forum for AI. And at the key, a key part of this is what we're calling <coughs> openness in AI. The idea is to build a technical framework that is rigorous and at fine-grained granular level that accounts for all the artifacts of AI and the workflows and the orchestration that connect them. The goal is to build a human-centered, participatory, inclusive AI that bends the arc towards augmented intelligence uh, and allows a broader system, ecosystem of players to build smaller, lightweight, more accessible AI models with direct feedback from underrepresented groups. It builds on CMU's expertise in AI, particularly responsible AI. I'm pleased to note that the co-director of the Responsible AI Initiative at CMU, Hoda Hadari, has agreed to lead the effort working with the CMU OSPO. 
Initial partners include the Open Source Initiative, which manages open source licenses and will provide legal expertise, and the Atlantic Council, which is a DC-based think tank affecting federal policy development. The funding support for all of these initiatives listed here, we're always grateful for external support, but I wanna highlight the support that CMU is putting in to both the OSPO and the engine, including through uh, library reserve funds. I will end with my standard slide, which has a question, Jen Stringer stole my thunder, uh, but I'll take that as a point of affirmation. It's a provocative question for you, but I'm interested in your provocative questions for me. Thank you. Hello everybody, I'm Dylan Riediger from Ithaca SNR and I'm here today to share a couple of data points from a report that we'll be publishing early in 2024, um, sharing findings from a national survey of research data support services that we conducted uh, over 2023. I, I should mention my colleague Ruby McDougall, who is not here today, but who developed uh, the methodology and conducted much of the research data collection and analysis. We are doing this work in partnership with 29 universities who are participating in our cohort project on coordinating research data support services across campus. And the inventory's purpose is to provide a detailed map about the availability and the distribution of research data services, excuse me, data services, and it's intended to support decision making about how best to coordinate those offerings going forward and to align them with researchers' needs. The inventory is based on a sample of 40 R1 universities, 40 R2 universities, 40 small liberal arts colleges, and a sample of the Canadian Association of Research Library members. And our data collection involved hand searching websites of universities that were included in the sample to identify formal research data services that were being offered by any unit on campus. As you can see from the slide, we collected information <clears throat> on where the service was being offered, um, what subjects and topics were being covered, and uh, uh, some information about the delivery format of those services. I'll say before I move on to share a couple of data points that we defined research data services for the, for the purposes of this project as concrete program office, programmatic offerings that were designed primarily to support researchers in their capacity as researchers. So I'll, I'll share two things. First, what services we found, and then I'll talk a little bit about which units were offering those services. The first thing I'll point out is that there are quite a few research data support services being offered by campuses these days. Um, we found that on average, there were over 12 at a typical R1 um, and five at R2s. And I should note that this uh, average can be quite misleading because even within C Carnegie classifications, the distribution of, uh, of number of services varies quite widely. Um, six R1s accounted for something close to a third of the total number of services we found. So there's a, quite a bit of internal stratification in how active universities are in this space. You'll also notice that res general research data management services are unsurprisingly the most common type of research data services that are being offered. Um, this reflects investments that institutions have been making to support open science and data sharing and also shifting uh, regulations by the federal government and other funders related to data management and sharing. I also just wanted to point out in light of the, an earlier panel today that approximately 72% of the services we found um, in both R1s and R2s are consulting-based services. Um, the number of those compared to the number of training-based services um, is uh, very favorable towards consulting and advising services. Um, this, again, I think reflects the value of those services, but it also poses some of the problems around scaling that we talked about earlier today. Libraries are still the primary provider of research data services, um, but as you can see from these slides at both R1s and R2s, um, other offices on campus are providing significant numbers of services. The research office and its kind of uh, 
cluster of research cores and institutes are perhaps the most, uh, are, are the second most likely people to be providing services. And in the full report, we'll talk a little bit about how the profile of services that are being offered differs across uh, which unit on campus is providing them. And finally, I'll just say that, uh, in, as I mentioned earlier, we'll publish findings from this in early 2024. Um, a few things that will be in the full report that I didn't get time to talk about today um, have to do with uh, what the landscape looks like in Canada and also at baccalaureate institutions, more detailed breakdowns of the subjects uh, and formats of research data services, uh, particularly any characteristics that are uh, related to what unit is offering them and also information and data about the distribution of research computing services and data repositories on campus. Thank you very much. I agree it was that good that it was worth breaking the no um, clapping roll. Um, <laughs> All right, so I'm Trevor Owens. I'm here to talk about the Stacks platform, a system for on-site access to rights-restricted digital content at the Library of Congress, where I work. Um, and so Stacks is a, uh, an access system for rights-restricted content. It's content the Library of Congress has custody or ownership of, but uh, is not an, a rental or subscription set of material. It's content that we can make available to Stacks terminals placed within our reading rooms and to LC staff, including staff in the Congressional Research Service. Uh, users can search, view, and print portions of works, but they cannot download or export content. Um, and it's a Python Flask Elasticsearch application. You can see a picture of it here on the side, uh, where you can also see a rundown of you know 170,000 books, um, nearly half a million newspaper issues. Uh, it's an exciting, growing uh, part of how we provide access to our collections. So some context on why we built Stacks. Um, First off, access to rights-restricted content is a key part of our digital collection strategy. I don't expect you to be able to read all this here, but if you do want to check it out later, it's up online um, as our digital collection strategy. Uh, a big part of this is that uh, as we work towards an e-preferred approach to building our collections going forward, a vast majority of the materials we acquire are not things that we can make openly available online. Uh, expanding open access as much as possible is a big part of our strategy, but uh, we're also focused on a coordinated program of policy and infrastructure to enable the broadest possible access to rights-restricted content. Um, so with that, some why of stacks. So as I mentioned, significant portions of our collection materials, whether it's things through copyright deposit, purchase, gift, transfer, or exchange can only be made available on site at the Library of Congress. Um, another area is that as we shift preservation reformatting away from microfilming to digitization, we're getting more and more digitized material that we can only make accessible that comes with rights restrictions. Um, here you can see a wall of, of book covers. Uh, of an exciting part of the material we get in Stacks is that a lot of this is things from, say, the cataloging and publication program where we're getting uh, a lot of widely distributed books that are published in the U.S. So here you can see things like Killer Bees and Fire Ants and uh, a book about Minecraft. Um, so there are public access terminals for the stack system in almost all of our reading rooms. There's a full list of them here. Um, and if you want to see what that experience looks like, you can see Marcus, who's one of the digital collection specialists that uh, is really heavily involved with working with stacks, here using one of those terminals in um, uh, uh, part of our main reading room. Uh, but you can see they're widely available across the space. The way that the access restrictions worked is that anyone can go to any of those terminals and use them. Um, if you're curious about how that works in practice, so uh, all the material that's accessible in Stacks is discoverable through our catalog. So you can see here the Ugly Caterpillar is a children's book from 2014. It says on-site access. If you go into the actual item availability on the record, you'll see a link that says available on-site via Stacks, and there's a handle, and if you're on-site and you click that handle, you go straight to the work where you can see it and search it. Um, and if you're off-site, you go to a page that directs you to the, uh, the way to get to the, one of the reading rooms. So here's a little bit of an overview of what's in Stacks. So uh, we're now over half a million newspapers and Legal Gazette issues. Uh, this is a largely made up of copyright deposits. So uh, registrations for e-print newspapers come in and are made available in Stacks. That's what the Wichita Eagle is here. Um, but then along with that, we also have a huge amount of um, uh, materials that we're now digitizing that are um, uh, newspapers from around the world. They go into Stacks for access. 
170,000 ebooks, um, uh, 700,000 uh, journal articles, but then from there it goes down to a lot of other uh, formats, music scores, moving images, map sets, etc. Um, and so that is a quick tour of stacks, and I think I can pass this over to our next speaker. And if I walk slowly, my uh, time clock won't start counting until I get there, right? So you can write down the URL. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, I would like to talk about Lux uh, very briefly with you all. So what, what is Lux? Uh, we think of Lux as a groundbreaking discovery, teaching and learning, and research platform thereby, of course, fulfilling the mission of the university, that provides unified, focus on that unified, digital access to the collections of our museums, libraries, and archives at Yale. We launched on June 1st this year with a total of 42 million records, um, and comprising uh, 17 million objects, 13 million works, uh, and millions of places, concepts, uh, people, organizations, and events. And if that wasn't enough buzzwords about why you should care, here are some more. So we think um, that Lux has an intuitive uh, and highly functional interface. It's built on linked open usable data, again, focus on usable, because that enables uh, maintenance uh, and uh, adoption beyond just Yale. It is reconciled and enriched from more than 20 different external data sets, uh, giving access to a vast amount of information that we do not manage at Yale. That happens automatically and, of course, at scale with 42 million records. We cannot, uh, even with students, um, do that by hand. And it has all of the functionality that you would expect from a discovery interface, including text, search, and facets, but also leveraging that linked open data for graph queries. So what were some of the things that came up uh, which we did not expect? So from beyond Lux, but within the cultural heritage organizations, uh, we found that participating and building data for Lux enabled both uh, the University Art Gallery to contract with an external vendor to rebuild their site based on the data that they provide to Lux at a fraction of the cost uh, of building their previous site. Uh, they, for that, they use um, external infrastructure, but the Peabody is taking that one step further by using the Lux infrastructure to build their collection site on top of uh, the data that they provide. Going even beyond cultural heritage, uh, it has incentivized people to think about where we can use knowledge graphs at Yale beyond cultural heritage. You know, can Lux discover relevant research data sets? We have a project which is sponsored by the university librarian, the vice provost for research and the CIO to investigate that question over the coming months. Um, are there benefits to describing core university functions, uh, such as where do you get uh, chicken nuggets from, for folks who were in the uh, last session? Uh, and, of course, um, not to do with chicken nuggets, uh, though reception, we'll see if uh, there are any. Um, we want to use the data to build AI services um, that don't suffer from hallucinations uh, by training on some of uh, that core curated knowledge. And if anyone has been playing a drinking game on the number of times folks have said AI, congratulations, you are still vertical. Uh, <laughs> it is after five o'clock. Uh, and finally, beyond Yale, uh, perhaps to you all. So uh, since launching Lux in June, we have had interest from more than 50 organizations from around the world, including many of the uh, folks here in the room, um, as to how we did it and can, uh, can they learn from it, can they adopt it. So we are currently cleaning uh, the code in order to make that possible. We'll publish it on GitHub in the next couple of months. And we proposed a 12-month project to the IMLS uh, for next year. We'll see if we, uh, if we get it. Um, if we are successful in, in getting that funding, we will host a, a meeting here in Washington, DC, exactly 12 months from now, following from CNI from Forum 24, to discuss two primary things of interest. How do we govern this in terms of the data model and the, um, the code, the processes, and the knowledge? And what are the collaborative solutions that we as a community can come up with to move beyond uh, the, those first initial technical barriers to entry that can then allow you to demonstrate value internally to your stakeholders um, in order to then take it uh, through 
um, the entire course of the work uh, to come to a product. So if that sounds interesting, perhaps not the chicken nuggets, um, then please do get in touch with me. Uh, my email is on all those slides. Uh, or find me at the reception in um, a few minutes, and we can discuss further. Thank you so much. So hello everyone, I'm obviously the European guy tonight. Um, my name is Julien Roche, I'm from France, I'm the university librarian at the University of Lille, and I'm there tonight because I'm also the president of LIBER, which is the European League of Research Libraries and the voice of research libraries in, uh, in Europe. Uh, actually, LIBER is the largest uh, association of higher education and research libraries in, uh, in Europe, and I will try tonight in the five minutes to give you a flavor of what LIBER is delivering. Um, this slide is summarizing the main activities we will, we will have. I will get back to uh, the, the ones in italic uh, later on uh, and comment briefly the other ones. Uh, so first of all, LIBER is a networking organization. Just giving you two examples, we, we produce a, a, a quarterly publication for our members. So 700 people received every uh, of a month uh, our internal publication. And we also have what we call the Liber Insider, which is for everyone. So you can register for free and get access to the main information we provide. We have thousands of subscribers for that publication. Um, uh, we also provide resources and guidance. Um, we publish them on, uh, on our website, we publish them on YouTube, and we publish them on Zenodo, so you can get access to hundreds of publications for free, videos, and, and, and so on. Um, we are uh, also working on learning and, and, and teaching and, and provide a lot of content you can reuse, again, uh, accessible on our website. Uh, we have a publishing activity because we have the Liber Quarterly with a high-level publication where we publish practical cases and, and also research uh, articles. And we have a lot of uh, uh, advocacy activity towards the European Commission, for instance. Uh, what I would like to also highlight is the, the main events we have. So we have a lot of activity during the year. We have an annual conference, a large one, every year. It's open to everyone, so you can register and come and join us next year. We have webinars uh, in common, just like the one we had in October in, uh, with UNESCO and La Referencia. We have what we call a winter event, which is more or less an internal event, just like uh, 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 you, you can have uh, in ARL or, uh, or with CNI. Uh, we have architecture seminars, and we, the next one will be in spring uh, uh, in Belgium. Uh, and we have, we develop master classes. This, uh, this is an example on citizen science, but we will develop uh, over in the future. And of course, things like journeys and, and, and other things. Uh, we have leadership programs, uh, uh, especially two programs, the Emerging Leaders, which is for second tier librarians, so people who are not university librarians, but would like to become in the future. And we have library directors, library journeys, uh, for experienced uh, librarians through the world, so it's open to people uh, not only in Europe, but also in the rest of the world. We also have a large part of activity about international projects. Um, we, we, have, we, we have something like uh, 10 permanent staff and half of the staff are working for international projects. For well, these projects are mainly European projects because you probably know that Europe is spending a lot of money trying to develop uh, higher education and, and research programs and, and a lot of them are for libraries. Uh, tackling with issues like open science, innovative scholarly communication, digital skills, research infrastructures and services, and citizen science. So we have there the names of the different programs, Shock, Recreating Europe, Palomera, Diamas Project. You maybe know some of them. You have all the details on, on, on the website, and uh, of course I would be happy to uh, have further discussion about that with, with, with you. Uh, nearly the end of my presentation, what I want, also wanted to stress is the Liber vision for research libraries in 2027. So we have fundamental preconditions uh, in the gray area in the bottom of the, of the picture, we, which are namely upholding rights and values and upskilling the library workforce. And uh, we have, let's say, three main areas, three main directions. Uh, which is to have engaged, interested hubs, to have state-of-art services in libraries, and, and to work on advancing uh, open science. 
So I will attend the reception. Please come to me and uh, let's start the conversation. And don't miss the Liber breakfast, breakfast roundtable tomorrow at 7.30. Thank you very much for listening to me. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for hanging around. Just a few more minutes. I know we can hear the clinking of utensils next door and the smells wafting in, so I appreciate your patience. Um, I'm Diane Goldenberg Hart with CNI, and the first thing I'd like to do is thank our um, lightning round speakers again. Thank you for those wonderful talks. So I just want to say a couple of words about uh, breakfast tomorrow morning. We're going to have a few tables reserved for discussion on defined topics. You heard from some of our facilitators just now in the lightning rounds. Um, and there should be up on the screen a complete list of all of the discussion tables that we are setting up for tomorrow. I want to note that the uh, list that's in the printed program is not the most up-to-date list. We have some updates. You see them here, and they also are on the online schedule, the SCED. In particular, I want to uh, note that we have added a couple of topics, um, two general theme topics. One is on evolving licensing models and strategies, and Lisa Hinchliffe will be uh, facilitating that table. And we've also added a table on AI and policy that will not have a facilitator. This is the first time we're trying that model, and with that and uh, all the other tables, we welcome your feedback. So just in a minute now, I, um, we've asked a few of our facilitators to do a very quick roundup, just about a minute each, on some of the topics that are on specific programs and initiatives that we thought could benefit from a little more information and context. Um, and the last update that I wanted to give about the program is that we will not have a table on information infrastructure and grand challenges from Don Waters, but Don is here and I'm sure he would be happy to chat with you about his project. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dylan. Hi everybody, um, Karim Bukita and I have been tasked to uh, take the AI table tomorrow morning. So we will be hosting a conversation about AI in higher education contexts. Uh, it'll be wide ranging, uh, bring what you want to talk about. We're focused primarily on research and teaching applications inside higher ed. We'd love to learn more about what your institution is doing and thinking about this topic and we'll have some things to share as well. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Salwa Ismail from UC Berkeley. My colleague, Todd Grappone, and I will be hosting a breakfast table at 7.30, um, talking about how libraries can improvise campus-wide research data services. So for those of us who are not doing uh, super fabulous, super innovative, super cutting edge, how can we move these um, services forward that then can organically become more coordinated across campuses? So at UC Berkeley, we've re-energized our library data services program in partnership with our campus IT, research IT, College of Data Science, and much of it was inspired by our Ithaca SNR big data study. And at um, UCLA, they actually did a campus-wide comprehensive study through a survey of their faculty members and then developed a roadmap on this. So join us tomorrow to talk through the approaches we've taken that's take, that's take, that are taking us forward as we talk about comprehensive, iterative, and improvised research data services. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I am Susan Ivey. I'm from North Carolina State University, but I'm here today uh, representing EDUCAUSE Research Computing and Data Community Group, also known as RCDCG. 
Um, so what is the Educause RCDCG? Uh, we're a group of professionals. Many of you in this room are probably a part of it already. If you're not, I hope you'll consider joining and learning more tomorrow at breakfast. We're a group of uh, professionals, mostly at higher ed, higher ed institutions that support researchers as they conduct their um, computationally and data intensive research and all of the things that go along with that as we support that work. Um, so what do we do? We have open calls throughout the year virtually and we also participate in the in-person Educause conference. We have meetups and we're also considering other ways to leverage resources that Educause makes available to us for things like working groups in the coming years. Um, so if you're interested to learn more, please come see me tomorrow morning at 7.30. Hi, everybody. I am Alicia Salas. <laughs> I am a co-lead of the Helios Working Group on uh, Shared Scholarly Infrastructure and also University Librarian at the University of Oregon. And I wish I could go to all of these breakfast tables tomorrow morning, but I'm hosting one. So um, I want to invite you to join me. Helios stands for Higher Education Leadership Initiative for open scholarship, and it's an initiative of um, over 95 uh, research institutions across the United States at this point. Um, and it is a presidentially driven initiative, so um, driven by a commitment of university presidents to work towards aligning incentives for open scholarship uh, within higher education and across sectors, including um, government and industry and, uh, and higher education. So I would like to invite you to join me at my table in the morning for breakfast to chat more about that work, um, ask questions, learn uh, how to join uh, or share ideas. Um, and current Helios members and non-members are equally welcome. Hope to see you tomorrow. Great, thank you to all of you, to all of our facilitators and to all of you for attending. Um, and with that, we are adjourned for the day. We'll see you next door at the reception. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.